Welcome to Cornerstone's Walking with God equipping class. I am Brian, and with me is Matt. Hey. And Scott. Hey. And what we've been doing in this class is teaching you how to live the basic Christian life. The whole thing is built around the discipleship pathway, and this is our last session overall, and the fourth session, also the last session, exploring the category of heart work, internalizing and applying what God has said. So, Let's quickly recap what we've done so far. Scott, can you start us off with session one? Yeah, so in the uh, first session of heart work, we talked about how the heart is the real you, how it is the biblical term used to describe kind of our inner self, and how heart work then is the process of internalizing biblical truth, having our minds renewed so that we might put off our old selves, put on our new selves, our new identity uh, recreated in Christ's likeness. And so we, we talked about how heart work is more than just stopping or fruit stapling, but that it is dealing with the root of the problem. And then in session two, uh, we talked about the the problem deeply rooted in our hearts that is idolatry, um, this idea of uh, uh, worshiping something other than God and what that, how that impacts our lives. And that at the end of the day, um, anytime we worship something else besides God, uh, whether it's control or family or a job, career, money, pleasure, whatever it is, um, that ultimately what it is is self-worship. It's actually kind of this curving in on ourselves. And we talked about the three steps of heart work that really address the problem of idolatry and address the problem of self-worship. The first being identifying that self-worship. The second being rem- being reminded of gospel truth. And then the third being being instructed with gospel commands. And then in our last session, in session three, we looked at the reality of suffering in our fallen world, about how we have fallen bodies and fallen environments, fallen cultures, which is Satan demons, and the the reality of, of life with fallen people. And we looked at, similarly, the three steps to address our suffering in this fallen world. We talked about acknowledging suffering first, and then we also talked about being reminded of gospel truth, speaks to our suffering, and being instructed in gospel commands, and and particularly um, in the call to trust God in the midst of our suffering. And um, and as actually we look back at just those last two sessions and and how God engages with us in heart work and um, in in the process of transformation, we we talked actually a lot about the relationship between sin and suffering, the the relationship between our circumstances and our responses. I think uh, we we talked about how we we usually think of circumstances as the things that cause our actions. But if if it's our hearts that produce our thoughts and behaviors and emotions, then our circumstances become the, really, and the suffering we experience simply becomes the opportunities that reveal what's actually going on in our hearts, um, right? Your, your child doesn't make you angry. They simply provide the opportunity in which your anger is displayed, right? Your boss doesn't make you anxious. She simply provides the opportunity that it, in which your anxiety is displayed. And, and so, so circumstances then, I think we, we see, and one of the things we got to see over the last couple of weeks, I think is so central and, and important is that circumstances don't squelch the fruit of the spirit in our hearts, um, I think sometimes we feel like that, like like it's our circumstances actually squelch the fruit of the spirit in our hearts. Actually, the circumstances simply shows off the fruit of our hearts, and when it's the fruit of the spirit in our hearts, our circumstances uh, put that in, on display. And so, in, in order for us to correctly then understand ourselves and the world we live, we, we need to kind of clearly comprehend. I said we kind of need to clearly comprehend. No, we need to clearly <laughs> comprehend these two categories, both suffering and sin, and how the gospel gives us hope and ministers in the midst of both of them. So in this last session, what we're going to do is is look at where heart work, and in a lot of ways where Bible and prayer, uh, take us. Like where, where does this stuff take us? And we'll, here's what we'll talk about. We'll talk about the end goal of heart work, And then we'll talk about the hope we have that God will get us there. So first, the end goal of heart work. Now, when we talk about heart work, at some level, what we're talking about is change. And and a lot of people, I think, if you're listening to this, you're probably thinking about heart work as a means of change, a way to change yourself. And yet, there's a lot of reasons people want to change, and not all of them might be the right reasons. And so, so Scott, as we start talking about the end goal of heart work and the change that accompanies it, how should we think about the different reasons people can want to change? Well, 
like I mentioned a few weeks ago, when, when people say they want to change, I think they oftentimes simply mean that there's something about themselves that they find annoying or debilitating or painful or inconvenient. Um, but God is not in the business of simply changing us into the ideal image we have for ourselves. I think that when we talk about motivations, like what makes us want to change, oftentimes it's because we have this ideal version of ourselves that that we exists in our head, it exists in our imagination, and we want to become more like that. But God's passion is for his glory, not our glory. Right? And to this end, God then is in the business of transforming us, not into our own ideal image of ourselves. He's in the process of transforming us into the image of his son and into creating in us Christ likeness, right? The, the, that, that kind of end goal, uh, that, that, that end result of the entire discipleship pathway. So, so heart work that is the internalizing of God's truth so that we might be transformed and ultimately become more and more like Christ uh, because of our longing and our desire to worship him and live, as we've talked about the last couple of weeks, a God-glorifying life because who he is and what he's done is so worthy of our praise and so, uh, so worthy of our glorification. So what we're talking about then is going to be bigger than us changing a few things, sort of uh, uh, softening some sharp edges, you know, tweaking some different things about our personality. We're talking about like God's will for our life in a really holistic way. Yeah, absolutely. What, what we're talking about is really the whole actual goal of the entire discipleship pathway um, as as it exists, as God has kind of um, designed what his will for our life is. Um, and we've looked at this process of killing sin, and we've looked at this context of suffering in our world. Um, but as we kind of wrap up the section, it's imperative for us to provide clarity as to the result, as the goal of the discipleship pathway. Um, because as we walk this discipleship pathway, the destination we're constantly pursuing, really uh, another way to say it, the will of God for our lives is our Christ-likeness, that we would be more like Christ, that we would be more and more formed into the image of Christ. It says explicitly that truth in 1 Thessalonians 4, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. Um, this idea of being like Christ, of being holy, of having this um, righteousness being worked out in our lives is is really God's will for our lives. Um, or thinking about Ephesians 2, uh, just a powerful passage describing uh, the truth of the gospel, that uh, we've been saved by grace um, through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. This powerful gospel declaration that it's not a result of works. It's all of the work of Christ in our lives. But then he goes on to say, really, the goal of this, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Um, there's this sense of uh, uh, being formed into this Christ-like image, um, uh, made into the image of Christ, and and I think about Romans eight, um, and we've we've talked about this passage before um, in a variety of contexts. But God works all things together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to what? Um, predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. Um, and that's really the goal of this discipleship pathway, and really the goal of heart work is this Christ likeness um, being formed into the image of Christ. So then, it's it's not just personality tweaks, and it's not even really our our desires for ourselves. At some level, this is a, a response to what God wants for our life, which is a wholesale change into the image of Christ. But then the question is sort of. So, so what difference does it make? Like, like if I'm trying to change and I want to make some tweaks or, well, now I think I want to be more like Jesus. Like what practically does having a goal of Christ likeness do as I go about the process of heart work and just life in general? Well, the reality is that this practically changes everything because it changes the motivation behind everything. And, and, and I mean, in one sense, that's a, you're asking practically, like, well, what does that practically change? I mean, it, it, it changed what I did last night. Right. Like I, I, as Laura and I were like had gotten the kids in bed and we were talking with um, we we're talking with one another about like how we were going to spend our evening. Right. We we've been talking recently about how we're called to spend our evening. Not like I, I would often ask her, what do you want to do tonight? Right. If we ever had a free evening, like what do you want to do tonight? Which is different than what should we do tonight? 
right? Like what, what, what would, what's, what are our ways that we can spend our time um, either glorifying ourselves or glorifying God, right? Whether, it, whether that's even like what you watch, um, what time you, you know, what time you spend, what, whatever you're doing, like this, this changes the way I talk to my kids, right? Cause I want to love them the way that he loved me. It, it, it changes the, the pressure a, or anxiety that we feel trying to get everything done because I, I can remember that he is sovereign. He's in control. He's good in working in me. And it, it also, I mean, it also changes, it changes the, the, it changes where we live. It changes huge things too, right? It changes the, 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 the process, even the decision-making process of the jobs we take and the career paths we're on. I and mean, so when, as we become more and more like Christ, it's not just these kind of tweaks along the way, but because it changes the motivation, it really does practically change everything from the big to the small. Yeah, and I think, uh, I think of another impact of this that I think is so helpful for me is, you know, if, if you just want like minor tweaks in your life, if you want to stop cussing, you know, like that's a pretty low bar, like right? and, and you know, like you're <laughs> yeah. you might achieve it, and you, I mean, maybe not, maybe for some of you. I'm sorry, I didn't mean it like that. I, okay, that 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 wouldn't, wasn't meant to be judgment, but I mean, in terms of co- in contrast to Christ likeness, like yeah. there's always room for growth as a Christian. You never arrive, you know, on this earth. You're never there. You never arrive. Like you're constantly needing to grow. There's constantly areas that you need to grow. And it gives you the security to say, like, I, if I'm going to grow, it needs to happen from the inside out. You actually can address issues from the heart level. Um, and, and, you know, I just think about, like, little tweaks or little changes in our lives where we, we feel like, oh, I'm radically different because, you know, I'm, I, you know, I'm not as angry as I used to be. Well, that's good. Um, but are you as loving as Christ is? There's this kind of, like, next steps of, like, constant growth and transformation that I think is a powerful vision for the Christian life. When I'm 85 years old and I've only got a few years of life to live, I'm still going to need to be growing more and more into the image of Christ. And that's a powerful vision um, for life in a lot of ways. So basically, one of the main practical differences sounds to me like it. I'm not setting the agenda for how I'm going to change and grow. Like Christ is setting the agenda. And if he's setting the agenda, then my next kind of logical question is, if he's setting the agenda, then what's my role in all of this? Like, if 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 the goal is being like him, as he as he determines it, then how do we participate in that as a process of hard work? Well, so we're engaged in it really actively. I think that the temptation is to think and assume that we're engaged in it passively, right? That like we sit back and just kind of like, okay, like let him change me then. But walking towards the destination of the discipleship pathway is essentially the process of progressively becoming more and more like Jesus. And if if that's the case, then we have to strive to actively live out that reality and that identity in every aspect of our lives or every decision we make then. We we make actively striving to to make those decisions in ways that glorify God, that honor him, that that, that manifest our worship, whether it's the the decision with what we do with our evenings to the decision of what city in the world we live in. Um, And and, and, and so it's not enough. I mean, the the reality is it's not enough to uh, simply learn, be convicted, and receive some assurance of the gospel. Right. And, and if in even in the last few classes, if as you've been hearing this, you're like, oh, like, that's good. That's insightful like that. That's helpful. And oh, that's freeing. Right. To be reminded of, of God's grace for me. God wants us. It's not enough to stop there. God wants us to actively live out the holiness he's growing in our hearts to actively pursue that that holiness, that that uh, righteousness in the in, in the best sense of the word. Um, this is right. right. James gives this exhortation in the first, his first chapter. He says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. This is, I mean, it's fascinating, right? He says, if, if, if we simply hear, like if you just listen to this podcast and you nod and you feel some conviction and you take it and go, but it doesn't actually manifest any change in your life. He says, you, you've deceived yourself that you actually know it. You've deceived yourself that you understand it. Um, he says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. I mean, I, I think that any time in God's word, 
whether it's your time in the Word this morning, whether it was the sermon you heard last Sunday, or whether it was the, the time you have spent listening to this pod class, right? If when that's over, you walk away and it doesn't change in some way how you're living, he's like, then you've just, each one of those instances is a mirror that shows you who you are and shows us the way forward. And God says, we shouldn't be like people who just walk away and forget every time we turn away from the mirror, but those who carry with us that image and seek to live out the reality of who we are. And so when, when we fail then to live out the Christ-like lives God is calling us to, really, it's because we've forgotten who we are. Right? This, is why we, this is why we've talked about the importance of needing to be reminded and needing to remember. You, you talked about uh, the other week, Matt, just the importance of remembering and remembering and remembering. We see it throughout Scripture. And our cult, I mean, our, our culture values living a life that's consistent with and authentic to who you truly are. But who you truly are internally isn't determined by how you feel It's not even determined by who you want to be or who you think that you are. Our true identity is determined by who God tells us we are. And as his children, he tells us that we are, we're redeemed and we're loved and we're holy. And this is who we are. And we're called to strive to to live that out. Uh, First Peter one says, therefore, preparing your minds for action, being sober minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, right? He, our father, is holy. And he says, he says, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And so all of this, right, everything we've talked about and every reminder of the gospel should result in us striving for holiness. And so what, what is, you know, what, what's our part in it? Well, our, our part is doing the hard work of striving for that holiness, of living that life that is honoring to God. Because while God has done so much for us, the reality is, he, and he has, he's done so much for us. He won't, though, obey for us. And he won't trust for us. Becoming more like Jesus is something that is empowered by his spirit, but is still up for us to practically take hold of. Yeah. And so what we're, what we're talking about then, Christ sets this sort of massive agenda for us, which is to be like him inside and out. I mean, there's a pretty, there's a lot of depth to that. There's a lot of, uh, it's a high bar, I guess, as Matt put it, but that's a really big thing to do given where we start from. And then we're really active in that. So we're supposed to be intentionally pursuing that, you know, being doers of the word. Um, that, that's, a, that's a lot to do. That's a lot that's happening. And one of the difficult things, I think, for a lot of people is that there's an awareness that that's never done, like, in this life. We're never, like, perfected in this life. You never find yourself going, oh, no more sin, you know, no more suffering, that, you know, and uh, 10, 15 more years. That, that's, that's not ever how it works. And that can be really discouraging, I think, for people And that's where, to me, and where I would want to take the rest of this session is there's actually a lot of hope. I think it's it's really not meant to be discouraging. It's meant to be really hopeful, and we don't look at it the right way, because what we forget is that we're not alone in all of this. That that God Himself is a part of this with us, like the same Jesus who has called us to that high calling of growing in His image is with us along the way and has given us everything we need to continue down that road, to actually be active and not settle for something less than his will for our life, which is being like Jesus. In other words, God is sufficient. He, he's given us all that we need for even something this big and something this wonderful. And so I, I would want to explore that. Like, where do we see God's sufficiency for this? Like, what are the different ways that we as human beings encounter all the different ways God has provided for us to actually do this? Well, I think the first Thing that we think of, um, and I think that that is really crucial in regard to God's sufficiency in this um, regard is His Word. His Word is sufficient to help us um, uh, really walk this path that He's called us to. I think your your phrasing, Brian, was really helpful. Just thinking about that, He's given us everything we need. 
um, to do what he's called us to do, to, to live this way. Um, and one of the ways he does that, does that is through his word. In, in Second Peter, it says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Um, and this is something Scott has said at different points. Uh, but uh, life and godliness are pretty big categories. They pretty much cover everything. Um, so God has given us everything we need, especially for the life, the Christ-like life of godliness that we've been called to. Um, through the knowledge of him who has called us to his own glory and excellence, this is Second Peter continuing, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Um, just such a powerful picture of the fact that God provides everything we need. Um, and this passage really specifically describes it as um, granting us his precious and very great promises. And where are those promises held? Where, where are they contained? In his word that he's revealed to us. All of the truth of God's word is um, the place in which uh, uh, everything we need according to life and godliness, everything that we need to follow and be faithful um, uh, in the midst of this, there's so much hope in this because God has provided everything we need, the sufficiency um, for being Christ-like uh, in his word, and, and it's contained in there. That's the, the first the first area. Well, that's going to play itself out in what you're doing in the everyday, too. I mean, as you open your Bible, there's a sense in which the the things you're reading are caught up in that. Like, it, it's not just sort of taking in some things God has said, like this is a part of him helping you grow into the image of Jesus. And that's a question we should probably all take into our kind of daily devotional reading is why am I reading this today and how is this meant to help me become more like Jesus Christ? It's just, I think, a great practical Bible study question. Um, One of the things, so talking about the sufficiency of God to grow us in the image of Christ, one of the things that I think can be easily overlooked is the sufficiency of the Holy Spirit in all of this. Um, and a lot of times, because that can be a confusing topic for people, um, they, their brains can go all sorts of different places when you bring up the idea of the Holy Spirit. But really, the the core idea of what the Holy Spirit does for us in Scripture is help us become like Jesus. I mean, you, you have verses all over the Bible that talk about this. In, in uh, the book of John uh, 16, you have the idea of the Holy Spirit convicting of like sin and judgment and righteousness. The idea, like, why in the world would would God do that? Like, at some level, the the Holy Spirit then is sent by Jesus Christ uh, and the Father to allow us to be convicted that we might grow, you know, into the image of Christ. Like, there's, in other words, there's a present help for you, like as you do this. He's, you're not left alone in it. Uh, John 14, this idea of the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. This is Jesus talking. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. So there's kind of a present ministry of the Spirit in even calling things to mind. And a lot of this is directed at the apostles in terms of the writing of Scripture. But that doesn't mean the Holy Spirit stopped doing stuff when Scripture was written. Now he's active in our life, and we talked about that in the Bible section, about the illumination of of the Holy Spirit, where he takes Scripture and can sort of call it to memory, but also he can kind of catch it to light in your heart. And so these things that you're reading about being like Jesus Christ, things that we want, Things like genuine humility, like sincere self-sacrifice for others, a sense of security in our identity before God and our future eternity. Like all these things that we want to be true of us at a really deep level, God himself in the Holy Spirit is actually like catching those to light in your heart throughout your life. So you're not doing this alone. And then there's, you know, the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5. We read that a couple of sessions ago where, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the things I think that every Christian looks at and goes, yeah, I I actually want that. Like, that's something I want my life to be. And they're dead on descriptions of Jesus Christ as he was on the earth and as he is now. And so this is an image of Christ-likeness. And it's not just, hey, you know, guys, I really have this high bar for you. So here's a list of things you got to do. No, this is the fruit of the Spirit. And so in a lot of ways, this is tied to prayer. This is tied to the idea of relating to God, of listening to his word, and then speaking to him in prayer and cultivating an abiding kind of relationship. Like that idea of abiding is one of, you know, the vine and the branches, the idea that you're plugged into something and abiding in something. And that's how a branch bears fruit. 
And so what you have is this idea that God himself is actually with us inside and around us, helping us and giving us what we need to grow into the image of Christ in ways that aren't small and ticky tack, in ways that are like love and joy and peace and patience. It's a pretty amazing thing that he's given us. And it gives you a lot of hope and a lot of motivation even as you walk forward in attempting uh, to be like Jesus Christ. And and like you said, I I think one of the most powerful things about that is the spirit and the word working together, right? To, To help produce that in us, that God provides these means and they interconnect in these powerful ways to produce this Christ likeness in us. Yeah. And you feel alone, but you're not alone. Like there's, there's a temptation to go, okay, like I've been given a job description, you know, like, and so I've got to go around and no, God himself speaking to you and indwelling you is a part of this process with you. You are never alone when it comes to hard work. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that that provides actually a, a great bridge to a third, uh, really category of sufficiency that God gives us, which is the, his body, right? Because not only does he, empower and illuminate his word by his spirit. But one of the main, if not the main delivery mechanisms of his word into one another's lives is one another. And we're called to speak truth to one another, empowered by the spirit in ways that, that, that brings about that this type of transformation in our lives. And so, so not only is the word of God sufficient and his spirit sufficient, but also his body is sufficient. We, we, we see this design in, in Ephesians chapter four, right? He says, and he, Christ, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints. And by saints, he means all Christians, or to, to, to equip every Christian for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood to the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. And that, that's what we're talking about here in Christ likeness, right? The, until we attain, we grow up into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And how, how does he how does he do that? How does he deliver that? Well, it's through the saints, all Christians doing the, the work of ministry. Skipping down a, a couple of verses, he says, how is this done? He says, well, it's through speaking the truth in love. But through speaking the truth speaking Bible truth, empowered by the spirit in love for one another. That's how we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. And so this is how God designed it. God designed his body to function this way. He designed his body to be the, 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 the sufficient mechanism of the delivery of his word, empowered by his spirit. And so not only are we not alone because his spirit is here, but he's placed us in a community that reminds us that we're, my, my son just asked me just uh, yesterday, uh, he's like, well, why, why doesn't God just like answer back, right? Like, why isn't he like talking like I'm talking to you? I think that's one of those things that we all wrestle with, right, at different times. And, and a part of, this, I, part, part of my answer is like, I don't know, like this is how he designed it. But a, a part of the answer is also because he designed his body, he left here and established his body, his commu- the community of believers to be those who speak his truth, to be his, his tangible words to one another. And, and we see that it's, it's through this, the body, through this, this community that we have insight into one another's lives and ultimately into one another's hearts. It, the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 3 writes, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart right? He says, okay, so be, be careful, right? T- take care because the, the, you, have, you have a heart problem and you very well may have a heart problem. He says, well, how do you te- take care to this heart problem that might lead you to fall away from the living God? He says, By, but exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that, you, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, right? How do we keep on guard with this heart problem? It's by exhorting one another, in the body of Christ. And Paul Tripp writes about this, and he talks about how without one another, uh, we're really just kind of left in like a, a spiritual blindness. Mm-hmm. Um, and he says, in this ra- reality of spiritual blindness has Im- important implications for the Christian community. The Hebrews passage clearly teaches that personal insight is the product of community. I need you in order to really see and know myself. I, I, in fact, I, like, I need you in order to know my own heart. 
Like I, I can't even know my own idolatries and the ways my heart needs to grow and needs to change on my own. I need you. He's, and he's, he goes on, he says, otherwise I will listen to my own arguments, believe my own lies and buy into my own delusions. And he, he compares our self-perception to a carnival mirror, right? Where like everything's kind of out of proportion because we, we, the way we view ourselves. And he says, no, we, we need one another to, we, we talked earlier about um, holding up the mirror of the word of God. Right and how we can't just like look at the mirror and then walk away and forget. Says, but we need one another. To, he makes the point that we need one another to hold the mirror uh, up for us, so we can see ourselves clearly in 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 His Word. We, which is why I think walking in the world, which we're going to get to in the next class, is such good a, teaser. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think you know, if we're talking about this, what's sufficient, right? It's the Bible empowered by the Spirit. But it's it, it doesn't start. This isn't just a solo, um, alone endeavor, right? It's why walking in the world is so important and such an important follow to walking with God, because essentially they're two sides of the same coin, right? Um, and, and as we're wrapping up our discussion on one side of the coin today, there, there's obviously more to explore to experience the, the the fullness of God's sufficiency for that He's given us for our lives. Yeah, I mean, you you clearly need other people. I, I mean, it's not even a carnival mirror. At some point, like it, even a regular mirror, like it's one of the weird things I think about being uh, well, being a human is that you actually are the worst person at seeing yourself. Like even just on a physical level, like the only, the only thing I have of what I look like is a two dimensional reflection in a mirror. Everyone else on earth sees me better than I can see myself. Hmm. Even right yeah, now, like, yeah. because we're recording this, you hear yourself over the headphones and there's a piece here that goes, Oh, my voice sounds like that. Because you hear yourself worse than everyone else hears you. You hear yourself like through all the bones in your head and stuff. Like literally everyone else on earth sees me and hears me more accurately than I see and hear myself, mm -hmm. even with a regular mirror. Yeah. Like, and so the idea of even saying, yeah, you've got all this great stuff going for you, but it's really just you. Like once you actually deal with how bad you are at knowing yourself, it's just deflating to think that you're on your own and to know that God doesn't just provide his own feedback, but actually surround you with multiple people who see you better than you see yourself and actually care enough about you to hold up God's word to you, that's just so encouraging. Mm. And it does make you want to go, okay, this makes sense as to why we're going to go and talk about walking in the world in the next class because it's, it, it, it's not finished until we get to those things. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So this is the last session of this class. And what we've done in, in the entire class is we've walked through uh, the Bible category, listening to and learning from God and his word, the prayer category, speaking and relating to God, and this last section, heart work, the idea of internalizing and applying what God has said. And all of this is motivated by the gospel. And like we just spent a lot of time talking about, it leads us to being more in the image of Jesus Christ, step by step. And so today we talked about the, the end goal of heart work and the hope we have that God will get us there mm. because he's given us all that we need in his word, in his Holy Spirit, and in community, and, and even in more ways that we didn't explore. And so here are some practical questions for you, leaving not just this session, but leaving the class as a whole. So as this class ends, where are your next steps when you think about Bible, prayer, and heart work? And how will you keep from losing focus on those things as part of your basic Christian life, as part of your walk with God? And then the next question, what is one practical area that you know God wants you to grow in Christ likeness? Like as you think of God setting the agenda for your life, what's something that pops into your head is this is where he wants me to be more like Jesus? And how then can you use the tools that we've given you in this class uh, hearing from him in his word, speaking to him in prayer, internalizing what he said through heart work in pursuit of that growth into the image of Christ.